Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anur Apul. Uh, Anur has just, he's just completing his first semester. He's basically a brand new assistant professor in UMaine's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'm not gonna repeat all the great information on our website about Honor's amazing background and his extraordinary accomplishments, but I would like to explain how I first met him. Back in the spring, the commissioner of Maine DEP, uh, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, Jerry Reed, sent a letter to UMaine's senior administration asking for help from UMaine faculty and students in addressing various challenges associated with the contamination of land and water in Maine by a class of novel persistent chemicals that often go by the frightening name forever chemicals. This led to a number of conversations with colleagues at DEP about the help they were seeking, including with Melanie Loisem, who has since become the acting commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. Melanie's also given a previous talk at the Mitchell Center, one of those ones you can go listen to. She talked about DEP's important work. She's also a graduate of UMaine. So our colleagues at DEP said they not only needed help figuring out the nature of the problems they're facing with these contaminants, but also what to do about those problems. And they were hoping an interdisciplinary team could help them by looking at the problem and the potential solutions from many different angles, drawing upon a range of expertise from the natural sciences, engineering, economics, risk communication, and other fields. As luck would have it, a world-class expert in the behavior and the remediation of these forever chemicals had just been hired to join UMaine's faculty in the fall. And that's uh, why I'm so thrilled to be introducing Honor Apple today. He's come here from uh, UMass Lowell where he was an assistant professor. But even before Honor arrived at UMaine in August, <laughs> he participated in a number of discussions as part of an UMaine interdisciplinary team of faculty who want to collaborate with DEP and other important stakeholders in the development of effective strategies for managing this enormous challenges. And as I got to know Honor over the summer, I was thrilled to see his strong commitment to interdisciplinary collaboration, to working with stakeholders, and to training students to become the next generation of sustainability leaders and problem solvers. Uh, if we were all together in room 107, where these talks usually take place at the Mitchell Center, I'd ask you to join me in welcoming him but I know you'll be thinking that way uh, as I introduce Honor Apple to give his talk, Sustainable Water Treatment, Moving from Victorian Era Technology to Nanotechnology. Take it away, Honor. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, David, for the kind introduction and also forging the platform for my presentation today. Also, I'd like to thank Mitchell Center for inviting me to give this uh, talk as a part of their sustainability talk series. I'd like to also thank Carol and Ruth for helping the logistics of this presentation today. And I'd like to thank every one of you for tuning in and choosing to be here today to uh, to listen to my presentation. As David introduced, I'm an assistant professor of environmental engineering as of September 2020 at University of Maine. And today I'm going to talk about sustainable water treatment technologies uh, within a context of moving from Victorian era to, um, to the future of water treatment. I chose two photographs uh, thematically representing my presentation today. These photographs are split by about 120 years. One is taken from Victorian era ages, and the other one is a modern photograph. A lot of things are different in these two photographs. Um, we can name the architecture. We can name the quality of the camera. We can name the fashion. and uh, Even we can name perhaps the implied gender roles in the society. But one thing is in common in both of these photographs is the importance of drinking water uh, for uh, safety and sustainability of human life. Water is a, is a universal nutrient that makes sure that life can sustain on earth. And I'm going to base my presentation today 
to explain sustainable water treatment um, using novel nanotechnology approaches. Before I start my presentation, I would like to request 30 seconds of your time and to answer these three simple questions so that everybody starts thinking about their own water treatment perspective. Please uh, use the pop-up window and answer these three simple questions. I think the water, I think clean water is important for my health. I obtain most of my drinking water from, and I think my drinking water is safe. I'll give you uh, 30 seconds and I'll appreciate if you could answer these questions. In the meantime, I would like to introduce a nationwide survey that we conducted a few years ago, asking 15 to 20 questions, including these three, to 1,400 participants across the United States. The, um, the results just popped in. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see the results, but I'll share them with you in a, in a, uh, in a quick second. The nationwide survey was designed to capture the age, gender, race, demographics of uh, United States, including the geographical distribution, income levels, and this survey captured a, a demographic uh, landscape of United States. The three questions, the first question we had ended up being the most agreeable question among all 20 questions. 85% of the participants thought that clean water is important for their health. People don't usually agree on things, but this one question was agreeable to most participants. Somewhat resembling the United States landscape, drinking water was obtained from grid water or city water by half of the participants. About 10% was using private wells to obtain their water, and one third was using bottled water. The importance of this, uh, this question is that the, um, the innovations or the advances that you do technologically or engineer, engineering uh, approaches mean that you can implement those to 155,000 plus public water utilities across the United States. Also, we have more than 40 million private well users that obtain their drinking water, which is not regulated by um, federal authorities, and they have to be responsible from, um, uh, from purifying their own waters. 33% of the participants uh, are using 200 plus commercialized bottled water companies uh, to, pr uh, to, to obtain their drinking water. This corresponds to a, 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 a large industry of $25 billion volume per year and corresponds to about 100 times more expensive clean water compared to tap water. Making a change to an industrial scale operation like a municipal water treatment plant that supplies water to hundreds of thousands of people is not an easy task. You have to make sure that you oblige by federal and state uh, authorities regulations. And also you have to make sure that the long-term impacts of the changes do not impact people negatively. Private wells mostly rely on their local guidelines. For example, in Maine, we have guidelines about removing arsenic from our drinking waters. So companies uh, that provide point of use point of entry type of devices 
uh, are going to be targeting these 40, 50 million people to sell their products. And lastly, the bottled water is not only 100 times more expensive than our tap water, it also produces typically a single-use plastic or glass waste that further pollutes the environment. The last question we have was perception of drinking water safety. And in this question, we received a 60-40 a split where majority of people thought their water is safe, but 40% thought there needs to be an improvement, at least in their perception. Our, our audience today is also agreeing with the poll results, the nationwide poll results. We have 100% of the audience thinking that the water is important for our health. About 74% is obtaining their water from tap water, 22% from private well. This number is larger than the, um, uh, the, the poll nationwide poll, probably because we have in Maine a more rural setup. And bottled water is 4%. And I would like to uh, congratulate the audience for not choosing bottled water as an expensive and en environmentally consequential source of water. And lastly, our audience thinks, 80, 89% thinks the water is safe and 11% needs improvement. Either the nationwide survey or our participants think that the water is important for our health, may need some improvement, and we are using one of these three sources for most of our uh, water needs. Okay, going, going back to the um, slide deck, talking about the um, historic development of water treatment, this is a, a a nice photograph from 88 years ago, taken in Nevada. If you have been to a water treatment plant, or if you are working in one, then you may be familiar with these bar rails are actually separating this operator from something called a rapid sand filter. This technology has been around since Victorian era, and you can visualize this as a packed sand bed. Typically, we sieve the sand to have uniformity of the sand particles. We use a pre-coagulation flocculation process to make sure the water actually is higher quality before they filter through the sand. And then we typically backwash, and this operator is likely to be uh, demonstrating a backwash to clean the filters, typically once a day. So this 88 years old photograph, moving forward to a recently renovated treatment plant in Colorado from 2018, is using the same exact technology of rapid sand filters. These rapid sand filters are backwashed probably with a computerized system, but the general infrastructure, even the way it looks, is very similar almost one century later. I'm not saying this technology doesn't work. It obviously is working, because since the early 1900s, the infectious disease-related death rate, which is on the y-axis, has been steadily decreasing. Excluding the World War I uh, influenza pandemic, we are experiencing, an, experiencing a steady improvement in public health, decreasing the number of infectious disease-related deaths mm -hmm per capita. These interventions include use of an antibiotic like penicillin or using vaccination uh, of, of general public and also using uh, rapid sand filtration or chlorination-based municipal water treatment. So these methods do work and they do uh, improve the, the quality of life and they do improve general public health uh, metrics. What I'm saying is these technologies have been around for a long time, but the challenges are changing. So the modern day challenges are changing. Yes, we are removing these pollutants from water for uh, public health pur purposes, but also federal and state agencies or local agencies are also enforcing stricter and stricter regulations for people to purify their water. So this is not only a an 
a wish or an elusive request of public health intervention. It is a regulated, federally and locally regulated um, engineering approach. And lastly, we have aesthetic concerns about drinking water. No one would like to drink water with color, smell or texture. Considering this, we have to think about what is our modern day or emerging um, emerging uh, water related issues. First of all, um, I'm, I'm not going to list all of them. I'm not going to talk about uh, climate change. I'm not going to talk about microplastics, but I'm going to choose a few of these modern crises that we are dealing with. First of all, we have more population. Now we have more population, meaning that a lot more people on earth are demanding clean water now. If you look at the 12,000 year of human history, in 1900, our population was 1.65 billion. And only in 100 years, we are pushing 8 billion people on earth. Not only this line, but if we had another line next to this, showing the water demand, it will be parallel to this. Am I right? Every person is going to require a certain amount of clean water to sustain life. Actually, the situation is worse than this because not only our number is increasing, but also our per capita water demand is increasing. Now we are flushing down drinking water quality water to clean, to clean the toilets. We are taking shower in drinking water quality water. We are watering the front lawn using drinking water quality water. So not only our number is increasing, our per capita uh, water demand is increasing depending on our uh, improving lifestyle, industrialization, and our evolving needs in this modern era. So our demand is increasing and also our source water quality is decreasing because now we have pollutants of emerging concern, meaning that they were not concerning for us in the past. We are using a mixture of chemicals in industry, in, dom in, 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 in com uh, commercial or domestic products, uh, in military, we are using a cocktail of several chemicals, including antibiotics, pesticides, herbicides, stain repellents. So this cocktail of chemicals are going to be ending up in our environment eventually and giving us a complex cocktail of source water instead of a pristine source water. I'm going to mostly talk about PFAS today, but we have increasing amount of pharmaceuticals, illicit drugs, micropollutants in our aquatic systems. And, and evidence to this uh, complexity issue was published in 2014 by a group in Arizona State University, and they surveyed uh, wastewater sludge, biosolids, that's collected uh, from an EPA uh, survey. And they compare these chemicals to chemicals that are found in human blood. So whatever chemicals they were surveying in the biosolids had a, a significant overlap with whatever chemicals that are found in human blood. Meaning that we are discarding those chemicals via industry, by, um, by wastewater, but those chemicals may end up either themselves or a transformation product in our bodies. So the complexity of our source water is increasing. The amount of clean water need is increasing and we are relying on a Victorian era technology uh, as of today. So I'm going to explain my research motivation and scope by using the Swiss cheese model. You might have seen this describing COVID-19 precautions. I don't have a mask now because there is nobody else in this auditorium. It's in my pocket. But there are several uh, techniques or there are several approaches to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So this, in this case, um, COVID-19 is try, we are trying to separate COVID-19 from people and there are different methods like masks, um, social distancing, social isolation, vaccinations, all of them have imperfections. These, these layers have imperfections, but if you stack them up, your protection against COVID-19 
pandemic is strengthening. So same logic for uh, our water treatment or water quality and preventing pollutants to go into people, we have certain engineering interventions. This is a simple way of thinking, but when we introduce a pollutant by industrial or domestic wastewater, a wastewater treatment plant is going to be one layer of prote pro protection. We are going to let these chemicals reside in the natural environment and their natural attenuation is going to help us a little bit. And then if we are going to use the source water, impacted source water, as uh, our drinking, uh, drinking source, then we will implement a centralized water treatment plant. And then depending on uh, personal choice, uh, or if you have a private well, most likely you have a point of use or point of entry water treatment system, such as those Brita filters or your refrigerator filters. Or you can think of an under the sink kind of an RO system. All of these layers have imperfections to prevent pollutants going into people. Well, one of um, my, my, my research uh, focus mainly is improving centralized water treatment and point of use water treatment systems by creative nanotechnology based solutions. But sometimes these interventions do not succeed. So this PFAS project is a thought provoking uh, um, uh, uh, organization that are really they are releasing these photographs of kids um, they are holding signs that says oh, my age is six and I have my PFOA level is 142 assuming this is parts per trillion because other photographs have parts per trillion or nanograms per liter concentrations this one says my age is four and my PFAS level is 117 how can you ignore this so sometimes our engineering interventions, all these layers may, uh, may fail to uh, pr uh, protect us from environmental pollution. My research group bases the, uh, the fundamental uh, values of, um, of research around these three, three word statement, responsible environmental nanotechnology. The, the, the definition in the dictionary of this is applying nanotechnology with moral, practical, and tr trustworthy approach. Meaning that whenever we are developing a nanotechnology-based solution to an environmental problem, we are trying to be mindful of the long-term societal, environmental, and economic impacts. So in the short term, we may be solving a problem, but we are trying to think long-term to make sure that we do not create a new problem trying to solve another an older one. Also, uh, we keep integration into practice, into industry, into actual facilities in mind, in mind, maybe not necessarily tomorrow, but at some point. So this kind of vision or this kind of thinking lines up our research constantly by thinking about the application challenges and, and making sure maybe 200 years from today, nanotechnology would be widespread but applicable. Lastly, we try to share the pitfalls and risks of whatever technology we are developing. Scientific community is good at sharing these pitfalls and deficiencies in their scientific literature, but Oftentimes we fall into the hype of finding a new, making a new discovery and sharing it with the public by sometimes omitting the pitfalls and risks associated with it. So my research group try, tries to be mindful of these principles revolving around these three words, responsible environmental nanotechnology. What is nanotechnology for people in the audience who may not be familiar with nano? is nano is a, 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 a prefix that is used in metric system. It means one billionth of a metric quantity. So a nanosecond is one billionth of a second, or a nanometer is one billionth of a uh, meter. If you visualize, try to visualize um, uh, a, a nanoscale is if you compare the size of Earth to size of a basketball, you would be making a fairly similar comparison 
between the same basketball and a nanoparticle. So we are talking about extremely small particles that are not necessarily molecules like chemistry is dealing with, or not necessarily bulk materials like material scientists are dealing with. They are somewhere in between. They are Manipul uh, they are understood, manipulated, characterized at atomic level. So we can basically manipulate these uh, materials in an atomic level and we can characterize, visualize them. And they have unique characteristics because they are so small, so much surface area they contain, but they are not necessarily chemicals. So they, this is a, a, a transition phase between bulk materials and chemicals. And nanomaterials could be any shape, any structure, any, any element. We have carbon materials like carbon nanotubes. We have uh, metal oxides like silicon dioxide, silver oxide, titanium dioxide. And we have natural, these are engineered from the shapes. You can tell they are organized, engineered nanoparticles. Also, we have natural like uh, aluminum uh, nanoparticles that are non-uniform, that are found in the environment, could be a, vol a volcanic eruption, could be a forest fire, that we can find these nanomaterials in the natural environment as well. So anything, any material that contains at least one dimension with less than 100 nanometers is considered to be a nanomaterial. And nanotechnology is using nanomaterials in whichever application field you deem suitable. My PhD research was using carbon nanomaterials. In my case, I used graphenes and carbon nanotubes. Those are again very tiny, a few nanometers in diameter, several micrometers in length, um, nanoparticles. And we investigated if they can um, absorb or remove synthetic organic uh, pollutants from water. We looked at, uh, uh, from a deterministic point of view, we looked at all these binary interactions, the effect of compounds on adsorption, the effect of adsorbent on adsorption, and the effect of uh, aquatic background, meaning the water quality, the ionic strength, pH, temperature on, on this adsorption phenomena. Without going further into details, carbon nanomaterials are um, nanomaterials because of their di uh, uh, diameters. Carbon nanotubes have a, f a couple nanometers if they are uh, single walled carbon nanotubes, and, and, and they can go up to 100 nanometers if they have concentric hollow cylinders, and they could be uh, multi walled carbon nanotubes. And if you cut open this single walled carbon nanotube into a two dimensional um, a uh, two-dimensional sheet-like structure, then you obtain graphene nanosheets. This is a Nobel Prize winner, isolated two-dimensional graphene, won the Nobel Prize in physics. And they're very unique properties. Don't, we don't really see these engineered structures in the environment. They are very unique in terms of morphology. And their morphologies, their electron distribution, give them very um, uh, special properties like excessive strength per light weight. So they're very strong materials. They are hydrophobic, meaning they don't like to be in water, which makes them suitable as adsorbents because they can remove hydrophobic pollutants. They can tune their surfaces. So these are excellent platforms that you can change properties on them. And they have excessively high surface areas. One single sheet per graphene nano sheet, um, if you consider both sides front and back, would theoretically contain 2,600 meters square per gram. One gram of carbon uh, graphenes, we are talking about one to two football fields, if we were able to see them. So high surface area and in water, they bundle up like house of cards or spaghetti structure, and they form these porous bundles in water. They also resemble traditional activated carbon adsorbents and they have extraordinary thermal and electric properties because of abundance of um, 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 conjugated electrons on their basal planes. So all of these unique properties, special attributes make them applicable in multiple industries, um, which, bring, which brought up the um, carbon nanotube industry to $5 billion this year, uh, with a production of 15,000 tons 
and $200 million for graphenes, although they are about 10 years younger than their sibling carbon nanotubes. So the question we asked in 2019 was, can we use nanomaterials to address this PFAS crisis? For, uh, for the members of audience who are not familiar with PFAS, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And this is a class of three to 4,000 chemicals bundled up together in one acronym, PFAS. The, um, the language that is commonly used for these chemicals are the forever chemicals. The reason that they are forever, and let me talk about the nomenclature a little bit. So we are choosing per and poly in this uh, structure. We have eight carbons. Each knot is a carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Each carbon is saturated with fluoride. If that's the case, except for this functional group, each carbon is saturated with fluorine, 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 then we are talking about a per fluoroalkyl substance. If some of these fluorines are not, uh, carbons are not saturated with fluorine, let's say we have a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, then it will be a polyfluoroalkyl substance. This is a chain-like structure. And as you can see, there are a lot of carbon fluoride bonds. Carbon fluoride is one of the strongest carbon, single carbon bonds that we know. So it's very difficult to break down. Breaking down is very difficult already. And on top of this, this carbon fluoride is, an, uh, is a polar bond, meaning that fluoride is more electronegative. So pulling electrons and creating an electron shield around this molecule. This electron shield is also coupled with a low pKa or dissociation constant of this molecule, making this a formally negative charged compound in environmentally relevant conditions. So we have an electron shield and a formal negative charge makes it very soluble. Also, um, a typically negatively charged reactive oxygen species like hydroxyl radicals are also negatively charged. So they cannot necessarily approach these and microorganisms do not, do not easily use these chemicals as terminal electron donors. So these chemicals are very sturdy, very strong, very soluble, and they don't necessarily degrade in environmentally relevant conditions. Why do we produce these chemicals then? Of course, because of these properties, these chemicals have a lot of outstanding properties. They were impl implemented as firefighting foams. They are surfactant or detergent-like properties, suppress oxygen transport in an interface of a fire. So it, it stops oxygen to penetrate into fire uh, and then kills the fire efficiently. We use them even in um, food, uh, food grade papers, wrapping papers. Perhaps you know those shiny uh, uh, papers that we use to wrap food. We have them in nonstick pens. We have them in stain and water repellent fa uh, fabric uh, coats. I'm not discrediting or I'm not um, uh, naming any products because I don't know which ones are still in use, which ones are not. But commercially, also in industry and also in military, these chemicals have been widely used and applied for multiple reasons. And of course, in the past decade, there was a surge, there was an overwhelming amount of research uh, output about PFAS. If you look at PFAS in Science Direct, today in 2020, the year is not over yet, but you have to read about um, 6,000 papers this year, meaning that you have to read 18 papers every year to catch up with PFAS literature. This is one of the most overwhelming chemicals that is overwhelming not only research, but also policymaking and application in industry uh, members of water society. Some examples of these published papers, the first one is from a Canadian group that they investigate the presence of PFAS in polar bears. Polar bears are located in one of the least industrialized regions, indicating that PFAS is able to stay, um, uh, stay intact and transport through uh, water and end up in polar bears. The second paper talks about PFAS in mineral waters and tap waters. They test 177 mineral waters, bottled waters, tap waters, 
and about 50% of them contain PFAS. So even in an intervention, let's say there's a PFAS outbreak, and as, a, um, as an authority, you would like to advise or, or give bottled water to your clients, you may end up giving them bottled water, uh, PFAS in bottled water. So it is important to be aware of how widespread this chemical is. And lastly, uh, this study actually I'm um, co-authored by 3M, one of the uh, major producers historically, but they ceased production. So this study shows about 600 uh, Red Cross uh, blood donors had PFAS in their bloodstream. But this article um, argues that since the production ended, the PFAS concentration in bloodstream is going down. Having PFAS in bloodstream may cause immunodeficiency, may cause uh, even carcinogenic um, uh, uh, long-term impacts. So how can we, um, uh, let's look at the, P the PFAS uh, situation in Maine. I just am quoting a PFAS task force report that is published in January of uh, 2020, this year. So in this report, um, it says, as of October 2019, Maine DP had more than 30,000 records for 28 different PFAS species at 245 locations across the state. So nowhere in, in the United States, PFAS is, you are exempt from PFAS, even in our beautiful Maine. The PFAS in Maine is discovered in military sites first, and one of them is located closer to us in Orno in, in Bangor. Kennebunk, Kennebunk Port, Wells Water District, and Lisbon, Lisbon Water Department, uh, two of these are serving 1,000 and 10,000 people, um, uh, reported PFAS. Also, it was found in, a, in dairy farms, the soils of dairy farms, uh, milks, and even the, the farmer's blood above the EPA's health and advisory limit. I know this, uh, this report is almost uh, 10, 11 months old, and in PFAS world, this is a very long time, so things might have been changing very rapidly. So what we did was um, my master's student who graduated in 2019, Arsalan looked at destructive and non-destructive methods using nanomaterials. Um, this article was selected as the cover article of the issue and then uh, ch uh, chosen as the best article collection of 2019 by the editorial board. He found that mostly studied PFAS and PFOA, PFOS and PFOA, and uh, carbon nanotubes, graphenes, and metal oxides were studied. But his major conclusion was these studies were conducted at PPM or PPB levels, meaning one or two orders of magnitude more concentrated solutions, although environmentally relevant concentrations are at nanogram levels. So we would need more work capturing more PFAS species, capturing more carb uh, nanomaterials at environmentally relevant concentrations. These lines represent the study. This blue, uh, I'm sorry, the green uh, uh, shaded area represents the environmental relevance of these chemicals. So we also looked at the um, destructive removal. Pyrolysis stands to be an, an effective method to, to break those carbon fluoride bonds at up to 700, 1000 degrees Celsius. Biodegradation has been an, uh, an not working um, and engineered pure culture systems, even uh, up to 100 and 150 days but recently in 2019, a group in Stanford demonstrated this one uh, species was able to uh, uh, defluorinate PFAS. This was a breakthrough, important in 100, over 100 days, but still critical. And lastly, this group is using, so this published in 2020 Proceedings of National Academy of Science, one of the most reputable journals, demonstrating that PFAS right here, compared to an antibiotic, amoxicillin, and BPA, compared to all of these PFAS, uh, BPA goes away 100%, amoxicillin goes away about 50% in two hours in their photocatalytic system, PFAS goes away about 10% in three hours. Although this seems very small, still an important breakthrough to, to destroy PFAS. For this purpose, um, uh, my other student, Bustra, she's a PhD student, created a conceptual model. This is the um, 
um, PFAS entering the environment, firefighting forms, general use industry, and circulating in the um, aquatic system through atmospheric emissions, through percolation to groundwater, runoff to surface water, and depending, depending on what the pathway is, and, and, and depending on the water sources, may end up in, uh, in water treatment plants. So if a water treatment plant may be using a granular activated carbon system, which is a gold standard for PFAS removal, which doesn't destroy PFAS, but it absorbs it and contains it in a high surface area of waste. So we have to be careful not to leach this PFAS back into the environment so we can break this forever PFAS cycle. So what she did is she evaluated the, the uh, thermal regeneration of G GACs or granular activated carbons as a method to stop the infinite recirculation of PFAS in the environment. She found that high elevated temperatures, 700, can degrade PFAS and uh, 1000 can completely mineralize PFAS in regeneration conditions. But she also found that if you regenerate activated carbon, you may be decreasing the surface area. So she thinks that nanomaterials could be useful instead of using granular activated carbons. I'm going to um, skip ahead. And she's actually investigating uh, microwave uh, regeneration of carbon nanomaterials because of their excessive reactivity to microwaves instead of using a higher energy consuming um, conventional heating systems. She's looking into uh, microwave systems. They are very selective, as you can see um, um, uh, the, the, the right-hand side of this uh, beaker is at room temperature. The left-hand side can go up to 300 degrees Celsius, 280. That you cannot um, uh, touch with bare hands um, side by side in the same beaker, microwaved for 30 seconds. So we could potentially uh, use a system where we remove PFAS using nanomaterials, you could regenerate using microwave reactivity or hypersensitivity of nanomaterials. We can desorb or we can destroy PFAS if we can reach the desirable temperatures. And then we can regenerate these expensive materials for infinite use. Same idea was also implemented by my master's student who graduated a few months ago. Uh, Richie tested microwave reactivity of uh, soils and he removed petroleum hydrocarbons from soil by um, uh, different energy levels. You can obtain up to 100% of petroleum removal. And then he tested if these soils are still viable for agriculture. Again, a similar idea pursued by uh, my master's student, Yeet, who graduated again a few months ago. He thought that waste activated sludge produced in wastewater treatment plants, before they go into an anaerobic digester, they could be microwaved with nanomaterials in it. And strategically locating these nanoparticles, we, we could actually accomplish um, uh, prehydrolysis, destruction of the cell walls and disruption of the flux. And we can improve the efficiency of anaerobic digester by producing more biogas and less residual sludge. I, I'm not, I don't have enough time to go into more details, but if you have any questions or any comments about any of these application examples, uh, we can discuss after the presentation. This is my last slide. So these are his um, results. Um, this is my last slide. Um, um, and, and I have actually four, I combined two and three, sorry. The um, um, human activity, no matter what it is, industry, military, or general public, is going to have a complex and cascading impact on public health and the environment. So we have to, mind, we have to be mindful of whatever we are doing as a society to make sure that two decades later, it becomes a permanent problem like PFAS did. Also, challenging times in terms of safe water access is ahead of us, if not here yet. The 2 billion people in the um, developing nations lacking access to safe water may seem distant to us, but with this pace of industrialization, urbanization, and population increase, 
we may experience the efficiency of safe water, and we will need to be creative to solve this crisis. In, in addition to creativity, teamwork and a long-term vision is critical for decision makers, for us consumers and researchers. And um, I believe there are a lot of nanotechnology-based opportunities that are beyond, beyond discovery, beyond our uh, imagination at this point that may help environmental engineering and science as long as we are mindful of their long-term impacts to society, to uh, economy, and to the environment. With this, all of this work has been done by students or co-advisees. I have seen some of them along the way. I would like to thank all of them for their hard work. Some of them have large checks. Uh, some of the funding agencies that were sponsoring our research in the past two, three years. Um, and also I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators, my friends, my mentors who has been um, in, in, in close contact with me along these uh, research projects um, um, and helping me uh, expand my vision. And I'd like to thank finally to all of you for choosing to be here and tuning in for, uh, for my presentation. I think we have about 10 minutes to uh, answer questions. I would like to um, leave the floor to Linda to, uh, to accept any questions that you may potentially have. Thank you, Thank you. for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I think we all feel like we just want to hang out with you and learn more from you. And we also want to, um, once, once we have this up on um, tape, watch it over and over again so we can fully understand all the ideas that you were talking about. Even before you started, people were already putting questions in the chat, things that they had, they had started hearing about what you're doing. And um, so I'd like to begin with one of the first ones, which is um, one of the people listening said, how does nanotechnology sewage treatment compare um, to constructed wetlands as a water treatment facility? cost, sustainability, efficiency, using uh, what parameters um, as measurements. And I hear that people are getting some echo, so I'll work on that while you answer. It's one because wastewater treatment using nanotechnology is underexplored for multiple reasons. And second of all, I have a particular interest in understanding, which is outside my domain, wastewater treatment, by association to environmental engineering, I have some knowledge. Wastewater treatment is not in my research domain, but I believe there is a lot of unused potential to treat sewage water uh, using nanotechnology. So when we are using a constructed wetland, for example, to, um, to um, uh, the lowest, uh, lowest technology, most affordable, uh, lowest intervention type of treatment, uh, we are taking a lot of chances that the nature is going to do what it's supposed to do over the course of time and we need to have a lot of land and a lot of accessibility to, to inexpensive uh, space. The nanotechnology in that regard may decrease the footprint of a wastewater treatment facility, perhaps help us to increase the efficiency, energy efficiency, cost efficiency, and and ensure the targeted chemicals like PFAS do not escape wastewater treatment. I think about wastewater treatment and nanotechnology often. I don't have a better answer than it's an unexplored area. And I think it holds a lot of promise for researchers. Thank you. Uh, you did a wonderful job of making us aware of all the places that PFAS um, can be found in Maine from former military sites to lots of other places. And I think that's very helpful for all of us as we're thinking about these issues. But people also had really interesting questions in the chat. One is, um, 
in terms of uh, where we find PFAS, one of the questions was, are PFAS found in popcorn, in shampoo? So what might you say when somebody has a question like that? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not eligible to discredit or endorse any commercial product. I don't know, but I would like to encourage everyone to be mindful of these potential commercial products. For example, non-stick pens used to be um, uh, one way to carry PFAS. Uh, popcorn bags, yes, the shiny popcorn bags, food bags, but it has been a progressive field and removing PFAS is important for commerce, for industry. So I'm not going to answer this question directly, but I'm going to encourage everyone to be informed about commercial decisions and learn more about PFAS in their particular products. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Another question that was asked was about um, healthcare organizations and researchers and how are they involved in terms of of PFAS or in terms of sort of understanding the research that you're doing, um, any thoughts about that? So the relevance of PFAS to everybody is obvious now at the uh, nanogram per liter levels in everybody's bloodstream pretty much. Yes, it may be decreasing, but we have replacement products like GenX or short chain PFAS that are replacing these uh, traditional PFAS compounds. So their toxicity is under in progress. Understanding their toxicity, understanding their direct health impacts is in progress. And it is a, a, epidemiologically, of course, it will be a very challenging situation because unlike other pollutants, we may not necessarily be able to isolate PFAS in one geographical location and 30 years later compare them to a non polluted location. So there's a, a lot of work ongoing. There's a lot of um, interesting publications about their particular toxicity to a particular tissue or um, a, a, an in vivo and in, in vitro. Um, so I would also, again, I'm not the expert about toxicity or health implications, but I would encourage uh, learning more uh, about, um, about their toxicities if they are especially concerned about their drinking water uh, pathways and commercial pathways, if they live nearby uh, a military site, it, it may be important to learn about their um, uh, long-term impacts. Thank you very much. Another um, really important point that you made throughout the talk is that responsible environmental nanotechnology approaches are really important that they um, need to be moral and practical and trustworthy um, in terms of uh, developing the um, nanotechnology. And you said, do not create new problems, that this is very important. In addition to saying that, you talked a lot about the importance of interdisciplinary teams, the importance of understanding the behavior of the forever chemicals, the enormous challenges but also training students. How do you see the training of students um, happening? What do you think is important? And as we're talking about um, interdisciplinary teams, do you see students from engineering, environmental engineering and other areas as being important? Absolutely, this, this problem is beyond uh, just engineering and science. Um, researchers focusing in the lab at this at this point. The um the first um, uh, the survey results that I shared um, under uh, underlines uh, basically this is a discovery from a social scientist, but it underlines that communities and people of color have less trust in tap water than um, um, uh, than others. The societal impact comes directly in, into play here. The communication or manifestation of a racial gap for water safety or water perception alone opens a new layer of problems. If a certain race or a, a group of people choose water, uh, drinking water, or choose bottled water over tap water, then you have a completely new you require a completely new integration of social scientists to deliver your message to those communities in a creative way so that you can actually improve their perception of clean water. This is just an example, but 
focusing on solely on engineering and science is not going to be able to undertake these incipient crises anymore. We will have to take social scientists, economists on board to make those decisions and also explain this to society much better than we used to. I'm not saying I'm good at that, but I know <laughs> social scientists will be able to. But I would like to um, um, uh, keep my doors open to, of course, from all, all disciplines that are interested uh, and then partner with them to make sure that we tackle this uh, together. I don't know if I understand the student part of it, but of course, students would be making those discoveries. Those students that we train will be making those discoveries. So of course, we have to invest as much as possible into those students' um, development um, um, that are under our training. Wonderful. And I think there are a lot of social scientists um, in Maine who are going to line up to work with you who are very interested in the things that you're saying. One of the um, one of the areas that we all see as important is the future, and that future really involves um, high school students, and it involves citizen scientists. Do you see, as you're thinking about different groups who you want to make sure understand what you're doing or might be interested in being involved, um, what are your thoughts about high school students or citizen scientists? For example, when I uh, was at the um, National Citizen Science Conference, uh, our keynote and our keynote group with citizen scientists from Flint, Michigan, talking about the, the water problems that they were having there. That's a long way to say, what are your thoughts about all that? Yeah. I'd say, of course, it's a joke, but I would say high school is too late to engage <laughs> in science. We, um, I believe that we have to engage with people as early as possible. I have uh, been in communication with Girl Scouts of Maine, the age six, seven, eight, brownie daisy groups, so that they learn and they develop interest at an early age so they can choose a STEM field in their careers. Of course, we have to engage students as early as possible in their careers and raise their interest level so that we can advance this uh, 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 further. We can advance this further. And also, again, we have engineers and scientists. We have proven over and over that our solutions to certain problems may create others, the ozone hole, the PCB pollution. We have historically developed these DDTs and pesticides. We have shown that we are solving problems in a, in a, a monodirectional way that opens a new line of problems that we have to engage with multiple stakeholders with different disciplines, backgrounds that can open a perspective that we might never have based on our training. Thank you so much. And I know there are many, many more questions. And Ruth Halsworth has been very kind to share in the chat your email address so people can continue to follow up. Um, thank you for spending this time with us on a rainy, um, dismal day and adding to our knowledge in this way and helping us see that we need to know a lot more um, and uh, that we're looking forward to you as one of the people who will help us with that. So thank you. Everybody in your, in your separate space, can you give him a hand? And again, thank you. And uh, we appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much for, uh, for, yeah. uh, for your time. And everybody, thank you very much for tuning in today.